Hello guys, welcome to this uh, MCAT biochemistry review video. I'm sorry, I, it took me a while to get this one ready, but life got in the way. But anyway, today we're going to have our rocking biochem review. Um, next slide. So why is biochem important for the MCAT, especially the 2015 one? Um, so I looked at the numbers and as you can tell, um, as most of you probably already know, that MCAT consists of four different sections, um, chemical and physical foundations of biological systems. Number two is biological and biochemical foundations of living systems. Three is psycholo psychology and social sciences. I don't know the exact official name for that one. And the fourth one is CARS, which is critical analysis and reasoning skills. So those two, those two we haven't covered yet, but these ones, um, they, they're kind of um, interrelated in a sense where they both consist of about 25% of biochem each. So there's a lot of, so there's about 50% of biochem related questions in the MCAT. So it's really important we get the basic concepts of biochemistry down before we walk into the testing center. So let's go to the next. So how is this video going to be structured? Um, unlike the last video I made about the general chemistry review session where I just talked to you guys about the topics and gave you guys tips and tricks on how to solve these problems in a real MCAT when you don't have a calculator and stuff. This video, I'll just give you guys the questions. So when I give you the question, um, pause the video. That's what I would recommend. Pause the video and try to solve it yourself. Get the answer and then I'll tell you the answer and tell you why that answer is the correct answer and give you the reasoning behind it. So basically I've chosen like two to three questions from each important topic of biochem and we'll dive into the topics as necessary as I said. So let's get, get right into it. All right first question. Which of the following statements is most likely to be true of nonpolar R groups in aqueous solutions? So what do you guys know about nonpolar R groups? So nonpolar so water is polar and water is hydrophilic, right? Hydrophilic just means water loving. <laughs> On the other hand, you have nonpolar. Nonpolar is hydrophobic. These guys do not like water. Um, the best way to remember is that because water is polar, like dissolves like, and nonpolar is not water, so they're gonna they're gonna be hydrophobic. Um, so the question asks, which one is most likely to be true about it? So we're looking for an answer that is true. Um, you got to be careful about that because sometimes they'll tell you that accept and um, following and all that, and that can trick you. So we're looking for an answer that is the most true. So they're hydrophilic and found buried within proteins. Well, we said nonpolars are not hydrophilic, right? So we're just going to cross this one out. That's not the answer. And is there any other hydrophilic? Yep, B. Being found in protein services. So yep, they are not hydrophilic. Now we're gonna look for two answers. They're both hydrophobic. C and D both talk about hydrophobic. So let's see the reasoning. C says they're hydrophobic and found buried within proteins. And D said they're hydrophobic and found on protein surfaces. What do you guys think? So if they're hydrophobic, would they be found on protein services? No, because hydrophobicity means they're going to be hiding inside because they do not like water, right? So the correct answer is C. They are buried within proteins. Hydrophilic are the ones that are found that are found in protein surfaces, okay? So the correct answer is C. Let's go to the next slide. Hey, look, it's the morning now. <laughs> um, in lysine, the pKa of the side chain is about 10.5. Assuming that the pKa of the carboxyl and amino groups are 2 and 9, respectively, the pI of lysine is closest to. Okay, so we're given four pH values, 5.5, 6.2, 7.4, and 9.8 in the answers, and we have to come up with an answer. All right, so what do we know about lysine? Lysine is a basic amino acid. It is one of three basic amino acids. Um, so you got lysine, arginine, and histidine. Uh, what makes them basic is the extra amino group right here. And so let me talk a little bit about the structure of an amino acid. I'm sure most of you guys already know. It's good to revise. So this right here, 
is the basic structure of an amino acid. This is like every single amino acid has this structure. And all 20 of them have this. So they would have a carboxyl group, then they would have an am amino group right here, and then they would have an hydrogen right here. Okay? So that's like all of them. They would all have it. The one thing that differentiates each amino acid from the other one is this R group right here. R, oh, oops, good enough. Um, and in this case, on the R group, you have another amino group. So that's why, you know, it's basic. And lysine is basic amino acid, is a basic amino acid. So here we have to, why am I saying this? Um, here we have, we're given three values. So in the question, it says pKa of side chain is 10.5. Okay, so that's the pKa of this, 10.5. Assuming that the pKa of the carboxyl and amino group are 2 and 9, so this right here has the pKa of 2, and this right here has pKa of 9. Okay, so now we have to calculate the pI. pI is the isoelectric um, point, and what that basically means is that it's, that's when the molecule is neutral. Okay. So we have to calculate the pi, and the formula for pi is that you take, um, you average the pKa values. But you gotta, you gotta know which pKa values to average because you can only do two of them, right? So in case of lysine, because it's a basic amino acid, we ignore the pKa of the carboxyl group. So you ignore this. So you do not take it into consideration and average the pKa of the side chains. So you got 10.5 plus the pKa of this amino group, which is 9. And you can average them. So you can divide that by 2. So based on this, so I mean, if you don't have calculator and you're not a top-notch uh, <laughs> arithmetist, um, this is definitely not 5.5, it's definitely not 6.2. So 10.5 plus 9 is 19.5. Divide by 2 gives you something around 9. So this is not the answer. The final answer is 9.8. So just this thing to keep in mind in this is that um, once you have the basic amino acid, so if you have lysine, arginine, and histidine, you ignore the pKa of the carboxyl group. On the other hand, if you have the acidic amino acids, like glutamic acid or aspartic acid, you ignore the um, you ignore the pKa of the amino group. Okay, and you take the average of the other two. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Just some easy trips and tricks. All right. This question asks, collagen it consists of three helices with carbon backbones that are tightly wrapped around one another in a triple helix. These amino acids is most likely to be found in the highest concentration in collagen. So what are some of the things that pop out on you in the question? So you're given proline, glycine, three amino acids. So it's asking about the highest concentration. So what it means, the question is asking, these all four could exist in there, but we want the one that exists in the highest concentration. And see, the interesting part that hits me is that the carbon backbones that are tightly wrapped around one another. So what that means is that um, you got a triple helix, right? Triple helix. So they're all just like spindles just wrapped around each other. And they're tightly wrapped. What does that mean? That means they're just molecules that are like, there's literally very little steric hindrance. That's an organic chemistry word. What it means is that uh, steric hindrance means if the molecule is too big, it'll, it'll be harder to wrap it around things or it'll be harder for a base um, base to attack it. So the least steric hinder hindered molecules are easy to get to. So in this case, steric hindrance is what we're really referring to because if you look at it, they're giving you a molecule or a collagen um, a protein that has these like triple helix that are really tightly packed. So would you really want an amino acid that is big or would you want something that's small? Well, of course you would want something that's small 
because if you have something really big, you won't be able to tightly pack it around each other in triple helix. That's a lot of tightening. So, what's the smallest amino acid in here? So the question, I mean, this question would help to know some of the structures of the amino acids. So, if you look at cysteine, cysteine has a sulfur in it. It is one of the two sulfur-containing amino acids. Uh, it's cysteine and methionine. Um, that's see, sulfur is kind of it makes it big. It doesn't make it smaller. So I'm gonna just take this one out. Threonine. This is one of the um, um, the OH ones. So this one has an alcohol in there. Um, and that also doesn't help with the small size of steric hindrance, so I'm going to take this out. Um, now we're down to pro, pro, proline and glycine. These two are uh, are one of the more like you know common ones or one of the most smaller ones. Relatively speaking, just know that glycine is the most basic amino acid there is. Not basic in the sense of its pH, but basic in the sense of that it its R group is the only one that is non-chiral. Its R group just consists of an hydrogen, so it's the smallest amino acid there is. Okay, proline has a methyl group in there too, so the answer is B, because collagen has a triple helix, the carbon backbone are very close together, thus steric hindrance is a potential problem in this case, as I said earlier. So to reduce that hindrance, we need small side chains, and the only one of the small side chain is glycine. Okay, let's go to the next question here. So enzymes increase the rate of our reaction by. So now we're talking about enzyme kinetics. Um, so here we're looking at the energy curve. Um, so A, decreasing the activation energy, decreasing the overall free energy, change of the reaction, increasing the activation energy, or increasing the overall. So I wanted to put a, actually my original plan was to put a graph on there so I could teach you guys, but then I was like, I really want this to simulate a real MCAT test because in there, they don't give you these graphs. So these are sometimes like free-flowing questions that they just ask you and you have to know the answer. So enzymes increase the rate of reaction. One thing to know about enzymes is that enzymes do not mess with the overall free energy of change of the reaction. They do not increase or decrease it. That is not the job of an enzyme. Enzyme does the catalyzing, but enzymes itself stays unchanged and it does not mess with the delta G which is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So it doesn't mess with the um, enthalpy, entropy, or the temperature at that time. So what, does it increase the activation energy or decrease? Something about the activation energy. Activation energy is the energy that is required of, um, that is required to, um, to get through that transition state for the enzyme. So transition state is, uh, so you have reactants, then you have products here, right? So it's that energy curve, the, so the energy curve, uh, if you're looking at it on the graph, that is the activation energy, is the energy that is taken to, um, to go through that transition state. So the job of an enzyme is to speed up a reaction, right? So if it's speeding up a reaction, it would have to decrease the activation energy because it's now that the reaction is happening faster. The more activation energy you have, that means the longer it's going to take you to get to that. So a lot of a lot of um, a lot of a lot of spontaneous reactions inside our body or in nature that happen do not have enzymes. Those have a lot more activation energy to go through. But here, enzymes decrease the activation energy because if they didn't, they would be kind of useless. I mean, in a sense, and enzyme kinetics it might be useless. But um, in other ways, enzymes are very useful things. They are just superb. So decreasing the actuation energy, not increasing. Next question. All right, now we're talking more enzyme kinetics. Um, the activity of an enzyme is measured as several different substrate concentrations, and the data are shown in the table below. Km, KM for this enzyme is approximately, so we're given 0 0.5 on 10 and 50. Then you have substrate concentration here, and then you have velocity in millimolar per second. All right. So, what do you guys know about Km? All right. So Km is basically the um, substrate concentration at V max 
divided by 2. So look at this graph right here. Look at this table, I mean, I'm sorry. So the Vmax on this is very close to 100. So this is the Vmax. What's Vmax divided by 2? In this case, you're going to have 100 divided by 2, giving us 50. And then you look at, you go all the way here to 50. Okay? And then this number right here, the substrate concentration at Vmax divided by 2 is 0 0.5. So your answer is A. Since the Vmax is near 100 millimoles per second, Vmax divided by 2 is 50, and the substrate concentration of 50 is 0 0.5. So this, these are the kind of questions that you just kind of have to know the formulas to, or kind of have the basic understanding of, because, I mean, you can go wrong with these. Um, because 1 is an answer, 10 is an answer, and 50 is also an answer on the substrate concentration, but you just have to know that Km equals Vmax divided by 2. Km equals the substrate concentration at Vmax divided by 2. Okay? Pretty simple. Let's go to the next one. Um, another thing, I, I couldn't really find a good question on this, but um, I'm sure you guys have seen uh, competitive inhibitor graphs versus non-competitive and how uh, and sometimes like your teachers or MCAT would have, to, would have you uh, choose one. Um, choose which one is competitive, which one is non-competitive. I used to get those wrong all the time in the test because I just couldn't get it down. But um, now I just made this table. I saw it in a book once and I just remembered it ever since. So enzyme kinetics, inhibitor types, Vmax, and Km. So how are these things uh, related? So one really cool way to remember is just to draw this table. And so what I would do is I would have this template. So I would just use this. So types of inhibition, Vmax and Km. So you have competitive, non-competitive, uncompetitive, and mixed type. All right, these are the four types of inhibitors. And inhibitors are something that actually um, inhibit the activity of an enzyme. So enzymes have active sites, right? Inhibitors just go and bind there, so the substrates can't bind anymore. So they're they're kind of like um, uh, they're kind of a, um, a way to regulate um, enzyme activity. Okay. So in competitive, so what I would write down is that competitive is Vmax because these guys go all the way. And then I would use the arrows. The rest of the stuff is just I would draw down arrows because they're going down. And then here I would come and I would write, uh, I'm going to explain this in a second, but here just remember this. If you can get this down, you're most likely going to have like very close to 100% chance of getting these questions right. Non-competitive is just KM, and then this one is up, so this one is down, and then this one varies, okay? So what's the point here, all right? So when you're looking at a curve, um, and a lot of times they give you the competitive versus uncompetitive curve, so if you're looking at it, you'll have the normal curve, and then you'll have two curves, and they will want you to guess which one is competitive and uncompetitive. Okay, so if it's if in the competitive curve, the Vmax would be the same as the regular. So it would be here. On the uncompetitive or non-competitive, the Vmax would be going down. Okay, so that's a really cool trick to know. Just screenshot this and read up on these inhibitors, and this will really help you. Okay, um, I don't really know what else to explain. Just, just read up on it and then go from there because this will really help you in a test question because those test questions don't really, a lot of times they're not testing the actual like basic of the basic knowledge. They're just testing if you know it or not, like if you can reason your way through it or not. And a lot of times these little tips and tricks really help you that reasoning. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP and inorganic phosphate is most likely catalyzed by which class of enzymes? So we're taking ATP, converting it to cyclic AMP and inorganic phosphate. So we're taking one molecule, converting it into two. Um, what do you guys know about ligase? Ligase, DNA ligase, is the one that uh, seals that whole um, fragment. So we know that DNA ligase doesn't do that because that's not one of its functions. Hydrolase, as the name suggests, it adds water. I didn't I didn't notice the question talking about water at all. 
it's just con taking ATP, converting to cyclic AMP and uh, inorganic phosphate, so it's not this. Transferase is used to transfer electrons um, between molecules. And here you're not really doing that. You're just taking one molecule and converting it to others. So it's not transferase. So the process of elimination says is lyase. And lyases, um, they are responsible for the breakdown of a single molecule into two molecules. So in this case, ATP to cyclic AMP and inorganic phosphate um, without the addition of water or the transfer of electrons. So that they're, they're, they don't do what hydrolase or transferase would have done. Um, they often form cyclic compounds or double bonds to accommodate this. Okay, so that's the answer. So you just, in this case, they were testing you on the types of enzymes. And on those, usually you can guess through the names. A lot of times it's harder, so it's good to read up on all the different types of enzymes. All right, we're back to pH. About pH, can protein A best be obtained through electrophoresis? So in most electrophoresis, electrophoresis is a really common lab technique used in biochemistry. Um, gel electrophoresis, SDS page, native page, all of those. Uh, so in most electrophoresis experiment, the goal is to separate one component from another. Uh, since we're trying to, we're attempting to isolate protein A, um, we have three different PIs here. They're pretty, pretty uh, widened out, so that that's going to be helpful. And molar masses, you got 25,000, 10,000, 12,000. Okay, so there's more of protein A here. Um, so this question is really interesting. Um, you don't really need to know the molar mass here. That's really not going to help us because we just want to know at what pH can we best separate this, okay? So if you're looking at this here, um, protein A has a pi of 4.5, all right? So at 4.5, so if you if you look at the electrophoresis chamber, um, you are the uh, the proteins are gonna run towards the anode, which is the positively charged electrode. Um, so they must be negatively charged because opposites attract, right? That's the law of attraction in that sense. Um, so we want protein A to be negative in order for it to get to the um, the anode on the um, electrophoresis chamber. So how do we make this? protein A negative while keeping B and C either neutral or positive because we want to really isolate this. Well, to make protein A negative, you're going to need a basic pH, basic. So something that is higher in pH. So when you're looking at this, this is not basic. This is not basic. This is going to keep it neutral. This is the only choice. 5.5 is the only choice that is going to that is going to um, make protein A basic. So if you add it to that environment, it's going to turn basic, negatively charged. It's going to run towards the anode and we'll be able to separate it. Whereas 6.0 is because 6.0 has a higher pH than 5.5. It's, it's just going to stay neutral or positive 9.5. It's just higher, so it's going to stay positive too. So our trick is only going to work if we use 5.5 because the others are higher and 4.5 is lower, and that helps with the basicity of the whole thing and making it negative, which makes it run towards the anode, and boom, we can isolate it easily. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Molar mass in this question was very useless. We don't really need to know that. So a lot of times you just have to know which which ones to just cross out. You're like, I'm not working with this. I'm only going to work with this. This is what the question is asking. Okay. All right. So which of the following methods would be best to separate large quantities of the following proteins? So you have three proteins, A, B, and C, just like the last question, you're given the PI and the molar mass. In this question, they're just asking you to separate large quantities. They don't really need to know. They're, they're not really worried about the PIs. Okay, that's not a concern this time. We're just worried about how can we separate these based on their size. So the size are pretty widened out. You have 28,000, 70,000, 200,000. Um, in this case, sorry, I just woke up. <laughs> um, if you look at native page, which is polychrylamide gel electrophoresis, um, it's the native one, it's not the SDS. 
um, there's a difference. So native, it would do that, but native doesn't take up that much, that amount of protein. That's a lot of uh, polypeptides. So native is out. It has a limit. I forgot what's the exact number for it, but um, native, I know for sure native cannot um, accommodate that many, that amount of molar masses. Um, isoelectric. Isoelectric, here, let me erase this real quick. So, see, look here. So, you got PI of 6.5, 6.3, 6.6. 6. Do you think, do you really think if you use isoelectric, we'll be able to, like in real practical lab setting, we'll be able to isolate that? No, they're so close, so, so close, that it'll be almost impossible. So, that's the reason we're not going to use. If they were, if their PIs were, like, uh, spread apart more, then we would be able to use it. Then you have size occlusion chromatography and ion exchange. Um, ion exchange chromatography is not really going to work because the PIs are so close and you're not, ion is something, uh, just a little gen cam review, ion is something that is either gained or lost an electron and so positive or negative char negatively charged um, atom. In this case, you're not, I mean, it'll be really hard to guess um, and it won't be very pure. So the only choice left is size occlusion. Um, the protein described in this question differ primarily in their molecular weight as their PI. They're so closed, as I said, and their PI values are very close, so you cannot use ion exchange or isoelectric. Native page you can't use because the molar masses are pretty high, so the answer would be, okay, let's go to the next one. When glucose is in a straight chain formation, it is. All right, so back at it. So when glucose is in a straight chain formation, glucose is a basic uh, saturide, right? So when it is in a straight chain formation, so when it's like looking kind of like this, you have a CHO and then four in there, OH, OH. I'm sorry, I'm using my mouse right now. <laughs> um, and then you have a CH2. OH. So that's in a straight chain formation. What is it? What do you guys know about glucose right now? It has, we know that glucose has six sugars, six carbons, I mean. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So it's not a pentose. Pentose has five, right? Now the question is is it an aldoketose or an aldohexose? Well, cannot be ketose. Um, because that's that's basically um, that's one thing you gotta just like know about uh, glucose because glucose is an aldehyde and has six sugars six carbons keep saying sugars um, so it's an aldohexose not an aldoketose so it takes that one out too so now you're left with two answers does it have five chiral carbons or 16 stereoisomers it can be both right so the thing you gotta know about these aldohexose is that in aldose sugars, like all of these aldose sugars, fructose and glucose and sucrose, each non-terminal carbon is chiral. So the ones, this right here, this carbon and this carbon are not chiral, okay? But these non-terminal ones, this, 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 this. So there are four of these, these are chiral. So that says it's not five, it's four. All right, and if you take to determine the stereoisomer of uh, chiral carbons, you just take two to the n equals n is the number of chiral carbon. So in this case, you have four, and that gives you 16 stereoisomers. So the correct answer is D. Okay, it's pretty straightforward question but you had to know some stuff for this one i mean you have to know stuff for all of them but uh, the cyclic forms of monosaturides are hemiacetals hemiketals or acetals only so monosaturides can exist as hemiacetals or hemiketals depending on whether they're aldoses or ketosis ketosis when a monosaturide is in a cyclic form the anomeric carbon is attached to the oxygen in the ring or the hydroxyl group and the anomeric carbon again is the one that is attached to the carbonyl group the one double bonded o that's the anomeric carbon 
Uh, so that's a big distinction in the monosaturides in a cyclic form. So there, monosaturides are not acetals or even ketals because an acetal or ketal would require the um, OH group to be converted to another OR group, and that is that cannot happen based on how molecule is structured. So we know it's not an acetal, neither a ketal. Ketal is not an acetal here. So, but we do know that most of them are hemiacetals and most of them are hemiketals. So the answer is C. Okay, the cyclic forms of monosaturides. They can be hemiacetals or hemiketals depending on whether they're aldosis or ketosis. But they can't be just acetals or, um, they can be just acetals. Which of the following is not a type of glycolipid? Oh, this is an interesting one. Um, so let's say you don't know, you don't remember what glycolipid was. You took molecular biology two years ago. You didn't really review it. So a lot of time, MCAT will test your comprehension, not only comprehension, it'll test your, um, ability to pick and choose. So I actually, when I first looked at this question, I actually had no idea um, how to, I didn't remember what glycolipids were, much less the, what are their like different types. So I just looked at the answers. Just look at this, right? You got, they all end the side, except one. We're looking for the wrong answer. We're looking for one that is not like the other three. Spindomyelin was the only one that popped up on me. And fortunately that time I was right. Most of the time I, I whenever I'm like guessing I'm getting it wrong, I know that. But on this one I got it right. And it was spindomyelin. So glycolipids basically to go over what glycolipids are, they're lipids with a carbohydrate attached by a glycosidic bond. So a glycosidic bond is the one that connects two saturides like to make a disaturide or trisaturide. Um, the glycosidic bond is the bond that connects the two. So if you're looking at glucose, one glucose, another glucose, the bond that connects the two is a, it's an oxygen right there in the middle. That's called a glycosidic bond. The role is their role of the role of a glycolipid is to serve as markers for cellular recognition and also to provide energy. Uh, so in this case, spinomyelin. Myelin, the last time I heard of myelin was in the neural neurons and stuff. Um, so I was like, that can't be one of the types. So I went for that and spinomyelin is the correct answer. All the other ones are the types of glycolipids. Okay. Next question, which of the following is true about cholesterol? Okay, so we all know about cholesterol. As Americans, we kind of love it. Uh, <laughs> cholesterol always increases membrane fluidity in cells. Cholesterol is a steroid hormone precursor. Cholesterol is a precursor for vitamin A, which is produced in the skin. So it interacts only with the hydrophobic tails. Okay, so few um, few red flags here for me. Um, whenever I read these questions, I look at the answers, and whenever there's an like a strong word like always or only, highlight that because most of the time that's not the answer. Because in biochemical chemistry, there are always exceptions. Uh, so here's like always increases membrane fluidity. Well, there are times when it doesn't, but you don't even have to know the times when it doesn't because always just such a strong word. It's like 100% of the time this is going to happen. And the chance of things happening 100% of the time is rare in chemistry because there are always exceptions. There are always things that can like, if there's one pathway, there are always things that can just change it up um, because that's how nature likes it. So I'm just going to take this one out because I don't think this is right. I'll explain the reasoning later because I just want you guys to get to the answer if you don't know the answer sometimes. Um, here saying cholesterol interacts only with the hydrophobic tails of phospholipids. No, it can it can react with the hydrophilic tails as well if, uh, in most certain cases. So only is a strong word too. So cholesterol is a steroid hormone precursor. Cholesterol is a precursor of vitamin A. Last time I checked that vitamin A was not produced in the skin. It is vitamin D. So this question is, this one is wrong too. But the most generic answer, so a lot of times it's like the generic one, the one that encompasses all the other ones. So cholesterol is a steroid hormone precursor. Damn right it is. Um, cholesterol is a steroid hormone precursor. And this answer is not 
it's not saying cholesterol is always cholesterol is only uh so like those kind of keywords are something to look look for um because those are usually not the answers so the question is the only correct answer is this cholesterol is steroid hormone precursor next um in a single strand of a nucleic acid nucleotides are linked by hydrogen bonds, phosphodiester bonds, ionic bonds, and van der Waals forces. Um, so here you're looking at a single strand of DNA. DNA is double-stranded, so you're just going to cleave out the other strand, and you're only going to look at one, okay? So once you're looking at one of them, so you have a nucleotide, nucleotide, nucleotide. What do you think connects those nucleotides with each other? Well, damn right, it's not ionic bonds, right? Because ionic bonds, they are like... NaCl is an ionic bond, so Na plus Cl minus, um, so ions, so two ions coming together. In this case, nucleotides are not ionic. Um, we know that. Van der Waals, <laughs> when was the last time we actually like really cared about Van der Waals in biochem? <laughs> I'm just, just putting it out there. Van der Waals is this just one of the ones you use in gen chem, but it's not measurable. Um, it's not that common, I, I would say. Uh, so I'll take this one out. Now we're left with phosphodiester and hydrogen. And remember, the question is asking for single strand. If it was asking for a double strand, then you would be able to uh, say phosphodiester. Uh, then you'd be able to say hydrogen bonding because then you have the amino groups from one nucleotide to the uh, carboxyl groups on the other amino, amino acids, uh, other nucleotide, and those form the hydrogen bonds. But in this case, it's going to be phosphodiester bonds. So, if you were thinking hydrogen bonding, you were close. You were very close because hydrogen bonds do happen in nucleotides, but that one is between the anti-parallel nucleotides. Um, that one is between the double-strand ones. Here, you're only looking at single strands, so you're only looking up and down. Um, so that one is phosphodiester. So three, three prime hydroxy group of one nucleotide sugar joins the five prime hydroxyl group of the adjacent nucleotides by a phosphodiester bond. Hydrogen bond is important, as I said, in keeping the complementary strands together, but does not really play a role in forming between adjacent nucleotides on a single strand. Yeah, would that make sense? Next, you have which of the following DNA sequence would have the highest melting temperature? Oh boy, gotta love these ones. Um, so you're given, they all kind of look the same, but they're not, all right? So here you have a CG, CG, CG and CA, okay. CA, 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 CG. All right. So melting point of DNA is the temperature which the DNA, um, DNA uh, falls apart. Which, uh, DNA denatures. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, so the denaturing or the melting temperature is directly correlated with the hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. So one rule of thumb is that C. So if you look here on this picture, let me change my color real quick. Um, this is C. So you see here, you have one hydrogen bond, two hydrogen bond. So C always go with G, so right here. So C, G, A, T. A goes with T, T goes with A, C goes with G, G goes with C. Okay, C and G always form three hydrogen bonds based on the way the purines and primidines are set up, okay? They always form three. Now, let's go with T and A. So T has, looks like T has two hydrogen bonds, and A to T also has two hydrogen bonds, all right? So that kind of tells you that the more C and Gs you have, the better or the higher your melting temperature would be, because C and G have three hydrogen bonds and it will take longer to break those three compared to the two for A and T. So we're looking for the, for the one with the most C and Gs. Well, looking at here, the answer would be A because A has two C and Gs, CG and CG at the end. This one only has one CG, one CG, so it doesn't have any. So it is basically all dependent upon the hydrogen bonding between the nucleotides. So here, as I said, C and G have three hydrogen bonds. The other T and A or A and T has only two. Okay, so that's why C and G wins. 
All right, a student is trying to determine the type of membrane transport occurring in a cell. She finds that the molecule to be transported is very large and polar and transported across the membrane. No energy is required. Which of the following is most likely mechanism of transport? So here you have no energy is required. So what do we know about no energy? That means no ATP is needed. So right away you take off active transport because active transport is the one that requires ATPs. Active is burning energy. It's actually like going against the concentration gradient. So you need energy. But in this case, you don't. no energy is required. Um, so it's not active transport. It's also telling you that the molecule is very large and polar. The fact that it is very large, it cannot be simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is just small little molecules that can just bounce back and forth. Uh, go from the highest con lowest con concentration to highest concentration. Simple diffusion is not an, an answer. Exocytosis, that's when you um, that's when you take something and you exit it out, secrete it out of the cell. In this case, you're transporting across the membrane. So you're making it come inside the cell. Site means cell, exo means exiting. So it's not that. So what do you think is the answer? Well, process of elimination says is C because facilitated diffusion is the only one that's left. Um, and in this diffusion, you're not using energy, but it's facilitated by another protein or another molecule. So, which in this case is really helpful because you're transporting a very large and polar molecule um, and no energy is required. So you just use process of elimination and you get your answer. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now we're talking about resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential depends on the differential distribution of ions across the membrane, active transport processes, selective permeability of the phospholipid bonds. Okay, so let's go through one by one. Differential distribution of ions. So, so when you, when, whenever we're talking about resting membrane potential, you think about the sodium potassium pump, um, and in that the the distribution of ions is very differential. It's very differentiated because a lot of times uh, you have more um, potassium on the inside, sodium on the outside, and they're just counterbalancing each other. If one goes higher, you activate the resting potential, you polarize it, depolarize it, and all that. So it does depend on the differential distribution of ions for sure. Active transport process as well, does it use the ATP? Yes, it does. It does use ATP. It's an active transport process. Um, so that is also true. Third, selective permeability of the phospholipid bilayer. Does it let every ion in? Does it let everything in? No, it's pretty selective in that sense. So resting membrane potential depends on all three of these. So the answer would be D. So that is the correct answer. Let's go to the next one. So a man collapses while running a marathon is taken to the ER. Blood is found to be acidic. Further tests show increased lactate dehydrogenase activity. This enzyme is involved in which of the following pathways. Okay, so acidic lactate hydrogenase. So you're only talking about the, uh, the, the carbohydrate metabolism here. So fatty acids are not going to come into play. Um, his blood is somewhat acidic following pathways. PPP is not. So I would recommend learning about each of these. Um, these two citric acid cycle happens in the mitochondria. But here the interesting part is they're telling you that he was running a marathon. Blood is acidic, lactate dehydrogenase. So if you look at the glycolysis, glycolysis produces two pyruvates. But in cases when there is no oxygen, when um, so if there is oxygen, glycolysis goes to the next cycles of citric acid and, um, and um, others to electron transport chain to make the ATP. But here's anaerobic because this guy was running a marathon. So his, his skeletal muscles needed more oxygen than what his heart and lungs would provide. So he went anaerobic. So the answer is anaerobic glycolysis. The other answers just don't make sense. Okay. Next. Each of the following catalyzes a rate limiting step of carbohydrate metabolism pathway except all right, so these ones are kind of just big names. Um, so you got to look for the answer that is false. So rate limiting step of carbohydrate metabolism. So carbohydrate metabolism, you're looking at um, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport chain. Um, glycogen synthase as a, so we're, look, so we're looking for the true answer so we can eliminate them. 
because we're looking for the wrong one here. Hexokinase. It is an irreversible, it can it catalyze an irreversible reaction in glycolysis, but it definitely not is it's not allergic limiting because uh, phosphofructokinases. So just this one. So if you don't erase it, uh, because we're looking at the wrong one here. Glycogen synthase is definitely one. Dehydrogenase is the one for citric acid cycle. There's one six by phosphate. Yep. So you just so I would I, I can like it's really hard to like go through each one of these. Um. So if you just just read like you don't really have to know each enzyme for all these mechanisms. Um, metabolism mechanisms or pathways. Just know which ones are the rate limiting ones. Uh, and hexokinase is definitely not the one for glycolysis. It's phosphofructokinase, and that's the only one that is wrong. So you're looking for a wrong answer. During a myocardial infarction, which is another name for a heart attack, MI, the oxygen supply to an area of the heart is dramatically reduced, forcing the cardiac myocytes to switch to anaerobic metabolism. Under these conditions, which of the following enzymes would be activated by increased levels of intercellular AMP? All right, pretty interesting question there. So based on the answers, I can tell they're testing our abilities to distinguish between different types of enzymes and what they do. So here we know that it's anaerobic and aerobic metabolism. So that means no oxygen. So let's look at our choices. Um, we know that on top of my head, the one enzyme that's really familiar to me is phosphofructokinase. Phosphofructokinase catalyzes the rate limiting step of glycolysis. And it's the only enzyme here um, that functions under anaerobic conditions. If you look at this enzyme, succinate dehydrogenase, um, it appears in both citric acid cycle and as part of the electron transport chain for complex two. If you look at um, isocitrate dehydrogenase, which is the choice C, that one is the rate limiting step of citric acid cycle. And pyruvate um, dehydrogenase, which is C, that one is one of the five enzymes that make up the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So we are looking at all these rate limiting steps. This one is citric acid. This one is um, uh, PDC complex. This one right here is also an electron transport chain and citric acid cycle. The only one left is phosphofructokinase. Um, and that is the only one that is the rate limiting step of glycolysis. And we know that glycolysis is the only one that is the only, um, uh, is the only cycle that can work without oxygen. Um, even though to, um, I think in the next slide or so, um, I talk about uh, the whole thing in more detail, but um, glycolysis can function without glucose, without oxygen, I'm sorry, and it's not a really oxygen requiring process. So since the patient, um, not the patient, since it's a MI, um, the cardiac myocyte switched to anaerobic metabolism. And under these conditions, to increase intracellular AMP, we need phosphofructokinase to be activated to help us with glycolysis, okay? So there's just different enzymes that you should know about. Next question, uh, which of the following incorrectly pairs a met metabolic process with its size of occurrence? So here I have a picture of, unlike the last few examples, I have a picture of mitochondria. So in mitochondria, you have the DNA inside, and this, this is mitochondrial DNA. You have a lot of genetic disorders that can be associated with this type of DNA. It's pretty cool. Um, and it's like mitochondria by itself is like a prokaryote, like it has the, its own DNA, it can do a lot of things by itself. It has ribosomes in there, so site for protein synthesis. And then I guess the most important thing or most important reason I put this picture in there because is because I always, personally, I always forget um, the matrix from the outer membrane and the inner membrane and the intermembrane space. So these things are really important. So you have the matrix, which is the um, inner uh, foldings of the mitochondria. That is the matrix right here. So right there, this is the matrix. And then the outer membrane, this is the out, like so in a floating uh, and cytosol in the side of, in the, when the mitochondria just running around the cytoplasm. The, the membrane that 
and gives it the boundary that is the outer membrane right here. So this stuff right here, the outer membrane. And then you have the inner membrane. So this is the membrane for the matrix. So this stuff right here is the inner membrane. And then there's an intermembrane space. So this is in between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. So this stuff right here. All right, now let's dive into the question. So the question is asking which one is incorrectly paired with a metabolic process with the site. Glycolysis, cytosol. We know for a fact that glycolysis happens in cytosol. And that is one of the reasons why a lot of um, a lot of uh, um, organisms that do not have mitochondria can um, they can um, still have ATP, which they can generate from glycolysis. So we know this one is correct, and we're looking for incorrect answer. So citric acid cycle, outer mem outer mitochondrial membrane. What do you guys think? No. Citric acid does not. Citric acid takes place in the mitochondrial matrix. It happens right here, not the outer membrane. Um, so we know this is incorrect, but let's go through all the choices. ATP phosphorylation, cytosol and mitochondria. True. So this is this is a correct answer because uh, ATP phosphorylation happens in glycolysis, which happens in cytosol, and then citric acid cycle happens in mitochondria, electron transport chain happens in mitochondria, so this is correct. Last choice is electron transport chain, which is inner mitochondrial membrane, which is right there. So this is also correct. So this is just the location of where these things happen. Um, so citric acid cycle is the outer mitochondrial membrane. That is the incorrect because citric acid cycle happens in the mitochondrial matrix. It happens inside, then it comes outside to do the electron transport chain in the uh, inner membrane space, in the inner mitochondrial membrane. I'm sorry. Okay, next slide. All right. So in glucose degradation under aerobic conditions. Okay, so we have oxygen present in this time. What are the options we have? Well, we have oxygen is the final electron acceptor. Oxygen is necessary for all ATP synthesis. What did I tell you about the red flags? Careful there. Net water is consumed. Proton motor force is necessary for all ATP synthesis. Well, so we got two red flags here. And what did I tell you about the red flags? Most of the time, if you are like, if you're not sure at all, you're like, oh man, this topic, look for the red flags. All, always, just, only. These are the words that are like, oh, I'm not sure, MCAD, you're trying to trick me here, but I know that these are, that's usually not the case. So you just, um, if I was you, I would just, uh, let me use a thinner marker here. I would just cross them out for now. We'll come back to them if we need to. Um, net water is consumed. That's an interesting one. Um, that is not true. Net water is produced in aerobic conditions and not consumed because you're talking about um, in aerobic, you go all the way to the electron transport chain. The whole cycle continues. And in that, at the end, you produce water, not consume. So this is not true. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. Well, notice that all types of cellular respiration starts with degradation of, uh, degradation of glucose, right, which is glycolysis. So you start with that. In aerobic respiration, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And water is therefore produced at the end of electron transport chain. So while oxygen is needed for aerobic respiration, in order to produce the optimal 32, that number is, they go back and forth, but it's pretty close, 32. Um, 32 to produce 32 optimal ATP molecules per glucose. It is not the only method which ATP is produced. So glycolysis, um, um, I mean, um, resp like, how do I put it better? Um, so here it says oxygen is necessary for all ATP synthesis, I guess, which is choice B. So I guess my point is that it is not required for all ATP synthesis. With, even without oxygen, you can still produce two ATP molecules in glycolysis because glycolysis doesn't really, doesn't need oxygen. 
is the next steps that need oxygen. So in order for glycolysis to continue in the citric acid cycle in the next two electron transport chain, it needs oxygen, but glycolysis alone does not need it. So if you don't have oxygen, your body goes to anaerobic phase and it produces two ATPs by lactate um, dehydrogenase. So the correct answer is that oxygen is the final electron acceptor in aerobic conditions. So remember the question, aerobic, so the one with oxygen, the rest of them are not correct answers. Okay, next question, the ability to exist in both an oxidized and a reduced state is characteristic of? So what does an oxidize or reduce mean? Oxidize means either you are adding more bonds to oxygen or you're adding oxygens, but you, were, but you are um, removing hydrogens and you're removing electrons. That's what an oxidized thing means. Whereas reduced, it means you have, you're removing oxygen or removing the bonds from oxygen and you're adding hydrogens or you're adding electrons. So ATP, interestingly, ATP does not do oxidation or reduction because uh, they're not oxidized or reduced because they just be phosphorylates or phosphorylates. They just add a phosphate or they remove a phosphate. So this is not a characteristic of ATP. Regulatory enzymes. Uh, regulatory enzymes generally do not do um, do not work with oxidized and reduced states. They work mostly with phosphorylation or dephosphorylation um, because they need energy. Peptide hormones. Haha, <laughs> interesting one. Um, hormones don't really need to be oxidized and reduced. Electron carriers, however, what's the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about electron carriers? NAD plus, right? Or Let me choose a bigger pen. NAD plus, so when you're thinking about silent respiration, NAD plus or FAD, so I just call them NAD and FAD. These are the electron carriers, and these guys are very, because they transport electrons back and forth, they carry electrons, they are very comfortable with oxidized, they're staying, being stable at oxidized and reduced states. So it's their ability to exist as both. Okay, so B is the answer. All right, where does beta oxidation of fatty acids occur within the cell? Good question. You have fatty acids. Cytosol? Nope. So in cytosol, you have glycolysis occurring there. Just to uh, rewind back. Plasma membrane? Nope. These kind of um, these kind of uh, complex reactions do not happen in plasma membrane. Um, this plasma membrane is just the cell membrane, right? It's just a boundary. It has a lot of phospholipid bilayers and stuff, a lot of um, cool uh, recognition patterns there, but not not a lot of oxidation happening of fatty acids because that's a big process. Um, then you have smooth ER. Smooth ER is the one that does not have ribosomes on it, and it's the one for packaging and all that. Nope. Just like the citric acid cycle, the ox beta oxidation of fatty acids also happen in the mitochondria. Whereas the synthesis of fatty acids, that is one that occurs in the cytosol. But the oxidation, so this gets synthesized from cytosol, and then, then they get transported via different uh, carriers to come to the mitochondria for beta oxidation. Okay. Adding heat to a closed biological system will do all of the following except increase the internal energy of the system, increase the average of the vibrational or rotational translation energies, cause the system to do work to maintain a fixed internal energy or increase the enthalpy of the system? It's a really good question. So we're looking for the wrong answer, okay? So which is increase the internal energy. Well, if you're, it's a closed biological system, you're adding heat to it, yeah, you're definitely gonna increase um, the internal energy. Are you gonna increase the average of vibrational or rotational translation energies? Even if you don't know what these things are, most likely, yeah, because the, I mean, if you're adding energy to a system, these will increase. So that is true also. We're looking for the wrong answers, remember. Cause the system to do work to maintain a fixed internal energy to do work. Uh, let's dive into it more. Or D, increase the enthalpy of the system. Well, enthalpy is the free, um, uh, free energy, right? Yeah, it will increase that too because you're adding heat to it. So boom. So you're left with C, you don't even, like, I mean, by process of elimination, you eliminated the other three. So, will it cause the system to do work? 
to maintain up well. In a closed biological system, enthalpy and heat and internal energy are all directly related. So there's no, since there's no change in pressure or volume, so you're kind of looking at it from thermodynamics perspective. Um, since pressure and volume are fixed, so you're only adding heat, you're not messing with the pressure or the volume. You're only messing with the temperature. Work cannot be done. Um, so it will not cause the system to do work. Okay, so just um, it's just a big definition that if, unless you add pressure and volume, then you'll make it work. If you're not adding that, you will not cause the system to do work. All right, guys. Um, so that was like about 26, 28 questions. Um, I don't know exact number, but thanks for watching. Please comment if you have any feedback. Let me know how it went. Um, I think it was a pretty decent review. Hope you guys like it. Um, I put a lot of time in these, so I hope you guys find them helpful. And they're pretty helpful for me too, as they like um, teaching is the best way to learn. Um, and yeah, please comment in the, in the comment section below um, and let me know what you guys think and uh, like and subscribe for more videos and stuff. And yeah, good luck in your MCAT.